So we have a new series starting next week. It's called One. And much like I've seen in the schools where people have, have, have unlearned a lot of what it means to be within community and to be part of a group of people, I think that's true for not just teenagers, but for all people. And so we have a three-week series coming up starting next week that talks about how can we be engaged with the people that are around us in, in, in a way that allows God's name to be made even more clear to those who aren't yet part of our group, but we're praying for them. So join us next week. And that means that this week is the final week of Hope in a Hostile World. A little over six months ago, we began a trek through the book of First Peter. A letter written by the Apostle Peter to the believers scattered throughout the Roman Empire. People who have seen some horrific stuff, including stuff like their friends being arrested and maybe even killed for choosing to say Jesus is their Lord and Savior rather than Caesar. And that was more countercultural than anything we can imagine doing on our own today. So countercultural that they may have lost their lives for it. We spent week after week diving into this letter two, three, five verses at a time because we wanted to be careful not to pass over any verse for its significance. In this, in this book, there are so many sentences and words that are of supreme importance. And not just, the Peter that, not, not just the people that Peter was talking to, but to us here, right here in 2022. There are 105 verses in this book. And today we're looking at the very last three verses. These three verses are separated from the rest of the letter because they are a conclusion to the previous 102. So after 25 weeks... Here we are on the last five sentences of our series called Hope in a Hostile World. I've edited the slide so we can celebrate the finale. Little did we know at the onset of this series that we would see things that fit this title so well. I'd say that it wasn't as much of a shock as it was just confirmation that this world actually is a very hostile place. And there's only one way to truly have hope in this hostile world. And that hope comes from a man who said, take heart, for I've overcome the world. That that man, being fully man and fully God all at the same time, walked through his creation. He saw the hostility with his own eyes and chose, even before the beginning of time, to do something about it. Jesus Christ did something that no one else could. Being fully God gave him the ability and the authority to forgive sin. Sin, which is the ultimate reason for the hostility that we see in this world, that we see every day. Being fully human allowed him to pay that debt. Because the cost of sin is death. And being fully human, he was able to give his life his perfect life, his sinless life, for a ransom for every person to proclaim him Lord over their life. Throughout the series, we have proclaimed Jesus as Lord, proclaimed him the Messiah. The Messiah we needed yesterday, we need today, and we will need tomorrow. This is the reason why we can have hope even when we look at the hostility in this world, a world full of brokenness. Some brokenness that we deal with personally in our own lives. That brokenness could come in the form of a lost job, a failed test, divorce, overprotective parents, rebellious children, inflation, or any number of things that we deal with on a daily basis in our own lives. Still, other brokenness isn't so much personal, but we see it on the TV and it breaks our heart. Brokenness like Russians' invasion of Ukraine, homelessness, a biological man stealing a national championship from a women's sport, critical race theory, critical gender theory, or any other number of critical theories that try to undermine God's word, rampant drug use throughout our city and our country, accidents that take the lives of of an entire collegiate golf team just trying to get home from their match in Texas, or any number of things we see on the news every week that is truly gut-wrenching. 
And although the brokenness is all around us and we can't seem to get away from it, and our phones, they ping, they ding, they ring, and every time that happens, we see some more bad news that's going on in our world. Yet we know Jesus. Yet we remember Jesus. Yet we continue to walk with Jesus. And in doing so, we continue to have a hope that other people in this world don't quite understand. One of the things that I hope people have gotten out of this series, this 25-week series, is that we, followers of Jesus, have a role to fill in society. That we are left here for a reason. As followers of Jesus, we are to walk through this hostile world and reflect the light of Jesus onto our surroundings. That's our job. That's why we're left here. But we have to remember each and every day that we do have a reason to have hope in a world that's so broken and so hostile. The final three verses of Peter's letter gives us that reminder. It prompts us to live a life in a certain way and refers us back to action. If you haven't already done so, let's go ahead and flip our Bibles, those beautiful paperback Bibles, to 1 Peter 5, the very end. We're going to go over verses 12 through 14. And read along with me. It says, By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Now all of you out there who dread that greeting time that we do every week, you should all be thankful that we're not taking Peter's advice here and telling you to greet people with a holy kiss or a kiss of love. I see some of you guys looking around wondering who you want to sit next to next week. And all of a sudden, this front row doesn't look so bad, does it? But our focus isn't on verse 14. Our focus is on verse 12 today. Peter says that it's by Silvanus that this brief letter has come to these believers. And I bet that the most common questions in people's heads right now, whether you're in this building or listening online, is one, who is this? And two, did Peter just say brief? We spent 25 weeks in this thing. The second question is easy to answer. The reason we took so long isn't because of Peter, because of us. We wanted to make sure we spent adequate time diving into Scripture and applying it to our lives. My grandmother, who we lo lovingly call ma'am, was a wee little woman with a not-so-wee little persona. Although she stood 4'11 and shrunk probably to 4'8 by the end of her life, she was as tough as nails. Not only did she work full-time nights as a registered nursing assistant while I continued college, college all the way until she was 80 years old to help me get through college, but one time... She even threw a gun-yielding ex of my mother down the stairs of her front house, unintimidated, 4 foot 11. She was tough. And although there are plenty of stories that illustrate the potency of this little lady, I think you get the idea. She's pretty tough. You don't want to meet ma'am in an alley. I share the story not because I want you to know how tough my grandmother was, although she was. I share it because she quoted something that's really fitting to this letter too. She said this. Great things come in small packages. There's my grandmother. There we go. On this, when this photo was taken, Avery was 95 days old. My grandmother was 95 years old. Yep. There she is, tough as nails. But great things come in small packages, that's what she said. And this letter of Peter's may be brief. It may be only 105 verses, but it's packed full of great things that we can apply to our lives even here in 2022. Actually, I would say especially here in 2022. As for the first question, well, that's pretty simple too. Although many letters written around this time, not just the ones that found themselves in the Bible, but ones written all over the ancient world, were written by a scribe as dictated by the author, many scholars believe that Silvanus was not the scribe of this letter, but the deliverer of this letter. A lot of believe, a lot Scholars believe that Silvanus delivered this letter after Peter had written it. So he's thanking him for delivering this letter. 
And Silvanus is actually someone that we met earlier on in the Bible. Actually, we're first introduced to him in the book of Acts, chapter 15. Here's what it says. Then it seemed good for the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brothers. Silas is to Silvanus as Bob is to Robert. It's just a shortened nick- nickname. Silas is the nickname for Silvanus. So we've met Silas here, and although we're introduced to him here, his most famous passage in the Bible comes in the next chapter, Acts 16. Now before we read this, let me kind of set the stage for you. There's a group of people, they're sent out. There's a group of people sent out to share the good news all around the region. We would call these people missionaries. We actually have a group of teens going to be missionaries this week. That's what these men and, and people did. Among the group was Paul and Barnabas, Silas, Silvanus, probably Mark, and of course the author of Acts, which is Luke. And they're walking around, and a slave girl starts, they see them and starts following them. And day after day, the slave girl follows these men, and she yells out every single day, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come so you can be saved. Now this woman is is possessed by some spirit, and she's a slave girl, meaning that there's people that own her, that make money off her ability to predict the future. And after some days, Paul, understandably, got a little bit annoyed. And he turned around to this girl, and, and he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And well, the spirit understood who Jesus Christ was and left her. This upset the owners, the slave girl's owners, upset them very much. And they complained. They complained that these Christians took away some of their ability to make money. So what happened? Well, Paul and Silas were thrown in jail. That's what happened. So beginning at verse 25 in, verse, in chapter 16, here's what it says. And this is where Silas is made famous. Among, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. So they're in prison, and they're singing and praying hymns to God. That's what they're doing. Chapter tw- or Verse 26. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken from its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains from every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up and saw the prison doors open wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself because he knew he was going to die anyway. Verse 28, but Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself. We are all here. An earthquake happens. An earthquake happens, and these prisoners don't leave. And they actually call out to the guard, wait, don't kill yourself, we're all still here. Verse 29, The jailer called for the lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas had every opportunity to walk out of the jail, but instead they understood that there's a soul here that's worth fighting for. I'm going to stay. I'm going to preach the good news. So Silas, or Silvanus, if we're being proper, has been around for a long time. He's someone that's done everything that he possibly could to make the name above all names known throughout the region. This is Silas. In this case, that means delivering a letter so important that it finds itself in the Bible, being read by people almost 2,000 years later. As cool as that is, that's not even the focus of our letter or our time today. It comes later on in verse 12. I call it 1 Peter 5.12b, meaning the second half of this verse. It says exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. I love the way the New Living Translation puts it. it My purpose in writing is to encourage you and assure you that what you are experiencing is truly part of God's grace for you. Stand firm in that grace. This is the focus. There's a phrase found in both of these translations. The phrase is stand firm. That's our focus today, and that's the focus I want you to leave this entire series with. Stand firm. This phrase is what I want everyone to leave with today. Other ways of saying stand firm could be withstand, hold out, stand up. When I picture a person standing firm, 
More specifically, a person that plans on standing firm. I picture a person ready for battle. That's what I picture. And of course, this caused me to reflect back on a series we did last year called Unity. And that was a study in the book of Ephesians. That was also about 20 weeks long. We, we sometimes take a long time to go through books of the Bible. But when I think about that series, I think about a passage towards the end where Paul advises people to put on the full armor of God. If we're going to stand firm, we should stand firm with a full armor of God. The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, and the sword of the Spirit. That's the full armor of God. And if we're going to stand firm, that's what we must put on. And although I don't believe that followers of Jesus should necessarily go out looking for a fight, there are things in this life that are worth fighting for. That's why I've titled this final installment of the series, The Things Worth Fighting For. That's the title of this. And I could probably come up with 50 things to go over that I think are worth fighting for, but I've narrowed it down to three that I know are biblical and we can walk out and know to fight for these things and we are doing what's right. Those three things are this. Things worth fighting for are the Bible, the church, and the soul. Those three things are worth fighting for. First, the Bible. The Bible's worth fighting for. I believe it is. We at Compass believe that God's word is the very truth of God. Inerrant in its original form, the Bible is perfect. We believe this is a timeless truth, not one that's no longer relevant or true, but truth that stands the test of time. We believe the Bible is worth fighting for because it is truth. I love the way a pastor from California named John MacArthur puts it in a talk he gave in 2015. He says it this way, the battle for the Bible is the battle for truth. The battle for the Bible is the battle for truth. The reason the Bible is worth fighting for is because truth is worth fighting for. Truth has been under attack since the creation of the world and the devil found himself in the garden twisting truth to God's first two creations. The devil's crafty in the way he twists and distorts the truth. And from the concept of marriage, what it's meant to be and represent to the very identity of people, Satan uses whatever he can to turn people away from God, his word, and a relationship with him. And oftentimes he's successful. He confuses people on their understanding of race, making it less about humanity and more about skin color. He complicates people in their understanding of sexuality and gender by making it seem that God's design for the two genders is belittling or demeaning or worse, a mistake. The devil drives a wedge between parents and children in order to warp the idea of of what God intended the family unit to be in the first place. The father of lies plants ideas in the heads of man that man is worthy beyond what God can give him. He says, I will give you all of this or that or whatever in order to distract them away from the idea that God has already given them the greatest gift, the gift of grace and forgiveness. If there's ever a symbol for what truth looks like, the Bible is it. That's the symbol. And the devil does anything in his power and everything in his power to draw people away from that truth. He convinces people that this book is old and outdated and not something that can be trusted in these modern times. These modern times that some people have dubbed post-Christian era. Think about that for a second. That that phrase exists and defines the time we're in now, and that phrase was invented to take people away from God's truth. That's why it exists. One more way the devil attacks the Bible and truth is to take away the truth from God and put it in the hands of man. Now, of course, truth isn't actually taken away from God. Satan just convinces people that it has been. Satan convinces people that they have the, the, the hand on truth more so than anything else. And more and more people are believing this. You may not see the devil here. Instead, you may see a really well-spoken, educated person trying to explain to others an idea that this person might call his or her truth. We don't own truth exclusively. It's God's. We're just lucky enough to know it. There are things that make an individual unique, 
And those things ought to be celebrated because God has created each and every person to be something unique. But it's not their own truth that makes them unique. It's God's truth that makes this special. Truth does not belong to anybody. It belongs to God. And it's unchanging. And it's by grace that anyone comes to understand the truth anyway through the Holy Spirit. The Bible is under attack because it's full of truth. And that truth comes from God. Contrary to popular, a popular quote from a movie, you can handle the truth. And it's in the Bible. And it's worth fighting for. The first thing that's worth fighting for is the Bible. The second thing that's worth fighting for is the church. I believe the church is worth fighting for. And when I say church, I recognize that there's kind of two ideas with church. Something I call Big C Church and something I call Little C Church. Big C Church is the idea of the multitude of believers all around the world, the people who have proclaimed Jesus as Lord at this church, at, at, at a church in Bend, at a church in Portland, at a church all over the world. We are all part of the Big C Church that proclaims Christ to be Lord. And it is an individual the small T church is, is an individual small church like us here in Bend, Oregon, a Compass Church. We're the small C church. We're a building, we're a small group of believers that comes together each week. We, we yearn to understand the truth of God, but we are, we are part of a bigger corporate group that we can understand exists all around this world. And there are things that, that we get to choose a little bit when it comes to a small C church. When we, when we come to faith in Jesus, when we, as Kelly Jones says, when we cross that line of faith, we are given the Holy Spirit immediately and a full dose of it. I don't care what your age is. If you're 13, you get the full Holy Spirit. If you're 83, you get the full Holy Spirit. When you come to faith, you get the full Holy Spirit, and immediately you are accepted to the Big C Church. Immediately. You're part of the brethren. Being part of a little C Church is something you get some choice in. But I want to ensure you that the choice isn't whether you should belong to a local church. That's not the choice. You should. The choice is which one. And the choice should really be based on, is my church biblical? Is my church focused on Jesus? And can I serve at that church? Those are the choices you can really make about which local church you should be a part of. But the choice isn't, should you be part of a local church? That's not the choice. You should be. Here at Compass, when we talk about people coming together and serving at a church, we call that partnership. We don't have membership. Membership usually comes with some, some benefits, but we don't know benefits to offer you other than a good church community. Partnership makes it seem like you're going to do some work. I feel like that's more accurate. If you're going to partner with us, you're going to work in us sharing the gospel with those who don't yet know. If you're going to partner with us, you're going you're to be part of the group that is beautiful feet sharing the good news. When you're a partner with us, that's what you agree to do. So the question again is not whether you should be part of a local church, but which one. And make sure that that local church is biblical, focused on Jesus, and has opportunities for you to serve. If you were here last week, you heard Kelly talk a little bit about how the devil has been successful in bringing down some churches over the past couple years right here in Bend. And many couldn't weather the storm called COVID-19. Some lost their locations to meet, and they lost momentum so much they had to close their doors. Others lost people because they moved away. Others lost their financial contributions because it does take money to make Jesus known throughout the area. But either way, churches were lost. Churches closed their doors, and the devil celebrated. Kelly also talked about how Satan was almost successful in taking compass out. There's truth there. Compass was close to closing its doors. Thankfully, one of the things that God has, has gifted me with is stubbornness and stupidity. <laughs> so here I am. That's not actually a spiritual gift. I'm, I'm kind of kidding. But I am pretty stubborn. But what we were actually gifted with is faith. We were gifted in, a, in, in something called faith. Faith in God. The fact that God was good and is good. Faith in Jesus, 
that he continues to want a relationship, not only with people at Compass, but he wants to use people at Compass to share the news that he wants a relationship with other people who don't yet know Jesus. Faith in the people that call Compass home. Compass exists today not because of me or Kelly or Truett. It exists because of you guys. Compass is a collection of believers. And without the collection of believers, we would not exist. It's important that you guys understand that. You had a role in Compass surviving. Compass stands here today because the people here today or the people online watching us were willing to look Satan in the face and say, not today, Satan. Compass continues to exist because there are faithful people at Compass that look Satan in the face and says, not today, Satan. Not tomorrow, neither. Actually, not ever. The doors of Compass won't close unless Jesus comes back or God calls us to. But Satan ain't doing it. I will be stubborn in that. Matthew 16, 18 explains to us a little bit about what Jesus' idea of church is. Is church worth fighting for? Check this out. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That sound like making a stand? Sounds like making a stand. I think, I think church is worth fighting for. But what's Jesus talking about here? On what rock? Well, you may have heard it said that Peter translates roughly to the rock, and and, and it does. But the church is not based on Peter. It's based on the truth that Peter speaks that's not from man, but from God. If we go back a few verses to verse 13, here's what happens. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Son of Man, of course, is, of course, is a way that Jesus referred to himself. So he asks his disciples, who do people say I am? And they say, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or prophets. Then Jesus said to them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's taking a stand. I'll continue to stand that. I'm not sure how you read this, but I can't read this without thinking that the church is worth fighting for. But why is it worth fighting for? Why is the church worth fighting for? I mean, you hear about how the church has done some really awful things throughout the centuries. And it has. Because the church is not made up of sinless people. The church has made mistakes. The church doesn't exist so sinless people can come together and gloat. It exists so sinners can come together and be saved. And continue to be saved. The church is Jesus' mode of operation of how other people can know that no matter what they've done, Jesus will forgive you. Forgive sinners. Sinners like me. Sinners like you. There's nothing you could have ever done. There's nothing someone you know could have done that's not warranted in forgiveness of Jesus Christ. They just have to repent. That's the hard part. We exist to let other people know that there's a way back to God. This is why church is worth fighting for. And this is why I will continue to be the beautiful feet of those who bring the good news. And I implore you guys to be that with me. The third thing that I think is worth fighting for is the soul. Now, truth be told, when I came up with these three things, it was the Bible, the church, and you. Because I think we as a church should be fighting for you. But what about you? It's your soul. We're fighting for your soul. And there's a war out there. There's a battle waging for the souls of man. And that, that war is as real as the world you sit in today. Spiritual warfare is a real thing. There are some great books that, that describe a little bit about what this might look like. Books like The Screwtape Letters from C.S. Lewis. Or a newer one called Playing with Fire by Billy Hallowell. The Screwtape Letters is a classic. I'd encourage you to read it. It's a really neat twist on what spiritual warfare might look like. But I really love the title of Hallowell's book. Hallowell's book is Playing with Fire. 
And actually, that book isn't necessarily that spiritual warfare happens. It's what happens when you dabble on the other side of the spiritual warfare. You're filled as a believer with the Holy Spirit, and that's the only spirit you should be dabbling in. That's important for you to know. And playing with fire talks about some of the situations where people played with other spirits. There's a spiritual warfare going out there. It's every bit as real as the one you're sitting in today. But one of the devil's greatest lies is that he nor demons exist. And people go on living life like they think there's no war out there. There are sides in that war. And there are casualties. But remember the words of John in 1 John 4, 4. Here's what it says. Actually, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus is not from God, this spirit is of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Remember, there's a spiritual battle out there. And the spirit you have in you is the very spirit of God. And there's no spirit out there that is strong in the spirit that is in you. When I think of souls worth fighting for, I think there's two categories. And here they are. The first are the souls of people who have already chosen to follow Jesus. They've already received the Holy Spirit. Their souls are not at risk. If you've chosen to follow Jesus, you are secured. God doesn't change his mind. But they're worth fighting for because they have an effect on the second category. The second category is people who don't yet know the truth of God. You see, the people who know God are attacked and are battled spiritually because they can share the good news with other people. Their souls may not be for sale, but people they talk to are. The truth that we're sharing is that God loves people and he yearns for a relationship with them. Truth that says their spirits are not dead, but they can be raised to life. Truth that says that your eyes may be closed, but the Holy Spirit can open them and enlighten you to something that you never knew existed. And this is done primarily through people in the first category. So whether you have chosen to follow Jesus or you haven't, you're involved in spiritual war. One may be for your soul, and one may be for the souls of those in your life. But these souls both worth fighting for. Every single one of them. There are three things I believe that Compass needs to stand up and say and stand firm in where these things are worth fighting for. The Bible, the church, and souls. As we go out today, I want us to remember those things are worth fighting for. They're worth standing firm. They're worth putting on the full armor of God for. I want to close this series the same way Peter closes his letter. Simply by saying, peace to all of you who are in Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, I ask for your boldness as we understand what is worth fighting for. Lord, I pray a fire of desire for people to understand these three things deeply. Understand the Bible. Understand that it's truth coming from you. That if something is not biblical, it's not from you. And the Bible is worth fighting for. And Lord, understand the church. Don't hide the bad parts. Don't ignore those. Lord, we repent for the things churches have done. And we ask forgiveness when churches have used their authority to take rather than give. Lord, we pray that we understand more why you left us here to be your church. Why that was your mode of operation. Lord, help us understand our role in that. And Lord, help us understand more that, that spiritual battle. That there is a battle going out there for souls. That there are people out there that don't know you yet. And until your Holy Spirit opens their eyes and wakes them up, their soul is lost. 
Lord, help us see people the way you see people. Help us understand how to share the good news and be the beautiful feet. Lord, we know that it's not something we do that opens people's eyes, but it's your Holy Spirit. But Lord, we have a role in that. Help us understand what that is. Lord, let us leave here today with all peace for those who call Christ Lord. We love you and in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before I step away and we close with a couple of songs, you are one of those two categories. You have either put your faith in Christ and your soul is sealed in God, or you haven't yet. And if you haven't yet, you run the risk of, of not being able to connect with God the rest of your life. If that's you, if you're someone who's wondering or has questions or even wants to make a decision, you know what? Today I'm going to follow God. Today I understand the truth is worth fighting for. I understand the role of church now. I want to be a part of it. I want to partner with you in sharing the good news because now I understand it. If that's you, come talk to one of us. Me, Kelly, Truett, Sarah, Lexi. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Try to answer your questions. Pray with you. Celebrate with you. Thank you. Okay, as we start singing, the, the baskets are going to come around. and um, You're welcome to stand and join us and sing after the baskets pass you by. If you're a guest here this morning, we don't ask you to give anything. Just being here is a big enough gift for us. So thank you. Let's worship. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. last he has ransomed me oh his grace runs deep oh i was a slave to sin jesus died for me yes he died for me who the sun sets free oh it's free child of God. Yes, I am. And my father's in my father's house. There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Who's not forsaken? I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I'm chosen. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am. I am who you say I am Who the sun sets free Oh, it's free indeed I'm a child of God Yes, I am In my Father's house There's a place for me I'm a child of God, yes I am, my Father, and 
in my father's house there's a place for me I'm a child of God yes I am amen I search the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise man's empty praise and treasures to fade are never enough then you came along and you put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing nothing is better than you I'm not afraid to show you my weakness and my failures and flaws Lord you've seen them all and you still call me friend cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley oh not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better turn morning to dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can you turn graves into gardens you turn bones into armies you turn into highways you're the only one who can let's sing it you're the only you're the only one who can oh there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Let's just do the voices. Let's just. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing, Lord. Nothing is better than you. Amen. Give yourself a hand. You guys did great. Give a hand for Jesus. Awesome. Hey, have a great day. Please pray for us if we go to Portland to serve at the Union Gospel Mission in downtown Portland. We'll be, half of us will be in the mission during the day, and half of us will be out on the streets ministering to people and meeting them where they're at. In Jesus' name. Have a great day. See ya.